Okay, y'all, about ready? You good? You ready, Doctor? All right. The Jackson Public School meeting is now, board meeting is now called to order. Uh, thank you for um, your patience. I apologize for, for running late this evening. Um, board members, we have six members present, uh, four in the boardroom, two on the line. That's Mrs. Johnson and Dr. Hairston. Mrs. Thompson is on her way. Uh, therefore, we have a quorum. We have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Thank you. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? There being none, the motion is approved. Uh, next, board members, we have all had an opportunity to review the minutes outlined. Is there a motion to adopt the minutes as presented? I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Everyone here, patience. There being none, the motion is approved. Uh, with that, we are on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Green. Thank you, Dr. Sivag. Greetings, board members, to uh, our JPS administrators, staff, scholars, parents, community partners, all those who've joined us here in the boardroom and in other spaces. Uh, we'll begin, as we typically do, with our uh, highlights reel from the instructional television team. High school student Jalea Ritas has been awarded nearly two million dollars in scholarship money. She has been accepted to schools all over the country. Her top five landing spots are all HBCUs. Ritas is currently enrolled in the JPS Tougaloo Early College High School. For the past four years being at an HBCU in high school has kind of showed me like this is the type of environment that I need to be in. Having students attend high school on a college campus does a tremendous job for building their confidence and their stamina about completing college assignments. Ritas will graduate high school with her associate's degree. The hundreds of hours of community service she has along with being a good student was key in getting all of that scholarship money. You cannot wait until you become a senior and think that you're going to be able to achieve over a million dollars in scholarship offer. She expects more acceptance letters and scholarship money to come. All the hard work that you've been putting in for the past four years are really paying off. A ribbon cutting ceremony took place on February 8th at Forest Hill High School. The event was held to celebrate the completion of several bond projects on the school's grounds. The grand total of which will be over $10 million that has been expended at Forest Hill. So we thank you for your support of this endeavor. The taxpayers have entrusted us to be good stewards of the money. The projects that have been, we've been able to complete at Forest Hill um, is evidence that we have been good stewards of the money. The projects included renovations to restrooms, the library, HVAC units, science labs, and updates to the school's coliseum. The renovations are a result of a $65 million bond that was passed by taxpayers in 2018. Almost 300 dads or father figures responded to the call to attend the Dad Summit on February 5th. The theme of the event was the dad's health is the school's wealth. One of the things that um, we were pretty determined to do today was not to, again, not to come and tell you all the things that you need to know about how to be a good dad and how to partner with us, but to have a conversation with you. And so a good chunk of this day is built around conversations. Men who care about our children, children in this district, children in this city, joining together, sharing your experiences, your ideas. At the event, dads discuss fatherhood, challenges in the community, and ways to better support their scholars and the schools they attend. During the general session, dads heard from experts in the financial and mental health fields. Fathers expressed how special summits like this one are just what they need as they strive to grow and support those around them. We plan to review the input collected from the dads and develop strategies around it to improve the overall school experience for our scholars. 
Nearly 100 JROTC cadets, along with 30 JPS scholars from Powell Middle School, participated in the West Point Society of Jackson's Leadership, Ethics, and Diversity in Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics in January at the Mississippi East Center and Powell Middle School. The annual event is a collaborative effort between the West Point Society of Mississippi, Jackson Public Schools JROTC, Jackson State University, and the West Point Diversity, Inclusion, and Equal Opportunity Office at West Point, New York. The workshop objective is to help students understand the link between ethics and STEM competence. JPS will host the COVID-19 vaccination blitz for community members on Wednesday, February 16th at Northwest Jackson Middle School and the Career Development Center from 8.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. The vaccinations will be administered by Northtown Pharmacy and Choices for Children and Family. The Jackson Public Schools Board of Trustees meetings are broadcast live every first and third Tuesday on JPS ITV Comcast Channel 19. The district also provides a live captioned simulcast of the meeting for the hearing impaired. Watch live captioned Board of Trustees meetings at youtube.com backslash JPS ITV. The district's official mobile app is also available. Get access to news, the district's directory, and much more. Download it on Google Play and from the Apple App Store. Search for Jackson Public Schools. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at www.jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools and on Twitter at JTS District. As always, we want to thank our instructional television team just for the quality of uh, reporting um, and the compilation of those uh, video reels. Uh, there's so much going on in Jackson Public Schools, so many wonderful programs um, uh, throughout the year, but I'm, I'm super excited about the things that we were able to highlight and experience across the district in this past month. And so just appreciate all of the work that's gone into uh, developing those programs and all the logistics and, and planning and everything from uh, our leaders and team members and community members. So huge thanks there. Uh, Jackson Public Schools uh, joins the districts all across the state in celebrating school board members rec recognition week, which is this week, February the 13th through the 19th, uh, honoring our board members for their leadership and, and service. Um, Jackson Public Schools board members work work to provide a quality education for all of our scholars. They also set help us to set school districts uh, a district goals uh, to adopt policies and to evaluate progress while maintaining focus on our scholars and their families and, and their needs. Our board members serve both as the community's voice in the school district and the district's voice in the community. I'm grateful for the privilege of working with uh, a talented and committed uh, school board such as this, their dedication and hard work have proven to be invaluable to the transformation and the continued transformation of our district. The fact that these leaders give so much of themselves in service to the scholars and families and with very little public recognition is just one more reason why we're saluting them today. They truly are unsung heroes. During the school board member recognition week, JPS invites scholars, staff, and community members to help us to celebrate our board of uh, trustee members. At this time, I want to welcome Ms. Ashanti Barnes uh, with a special presentation from Van Winkle Pre-K Center. Ms. Barnes. I'm kidding. You see how we complied. <laughs> I am so super excited to be here as the lead learner for Van Winkle Early Childhood Center, better known as Van Wonderful. I have the esteemed pleasure of uh, introducing Elijah Joy Major. Elijah Joy was born on June 1st, 2017 to the parents of Joy Major <laughs> and Antonio Mann in Orlando, Florida. 
She later moved to Mississippi six months later. Mississippi is truly all she has ever known. Elijah began doing pageants at eight months old. It was there her mother learned how much she loved the stage. She has been on the stage ever since one of her current, ever since she learned how to walk. One of her current titles being The Face of Mississippi Sweet Pea. Uh, everybody insert aw. Aw, yeah. Her <laughs> hobbies include various forms of dance and singing, of course. When she is not on stage, you can find her at Van Winkle Early Childhood Center excelling through their pre-K program. Elijah Joy is not too sure what she wants to be just yet, but touching the lives of others is definitely one of her long-term goals. Why don't you put your hands together as Elijah Joy comes. <laughs> Clap her all the way up. Yay. Good afternoon. My name is Elijah Joy. I bring you greetings from a city of soul, Jackson, Mississippi. Oh. <laughs> He's like, I don't want to turn my back to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Take one more bow, one more big bow. So, Elijah Joy, if you'll join us, we want to take a picture. Is it okay if we take a picture with you? So I'm going to ask all of my board members who are here in the room to join me down front with your plaques. We will. You have those in front of you. 
join me and we will take a picture with Ms. Elijah Joy. Oh, wow. And again, say thanks to all of our board members for your hard work and dedication. so hard. <laughs> My goodness. All right. So again, we just want to uh, appreciate all of our board members, to those board members who um, are not able to be with us here in the room, to uh, Dr. Hairston and, and board member Johnson. We just greatly appreciate each and every one of you and we know that you give so much of your time and your talents um, and, and just give of yourselves and, and it does not go unnoticed. I say all the time to others who are not here witnessing your work, just how powerful this board is by the way that you collaborate and hold us accountable for um, delivering for kids and for the community. And so just again, thank you. Let's give it a, another round of applause. All right, continuing with this whole recognition bit, uh, board members, each year, our graduating seniors receive tens of millions of dollars in scholarship offers. And although we are still several months from graduation, scholarships are already pouring in for one Jim Hill Early College High scholar. And so far, she has received nearly $2.5 million in scholarships. Oh my goodness, <laughs> already. Um, and so at this time, I'm going to invite Mrs. Marshall Thomas, our Assistant Superintendent for High Schools, to join us and introduce and bring on this amazing scholar, Mrs. Thomas. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Ms. Jalea Reedus, will you please come forward? Jim Hill High School, and Jalea, you can just stand right at the front. I want everybody to take a good look at Jalea. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Hill High School senior Jalea Reedus was recently awarded nearly $2 million in academic scholarships. Jalea attends college, college at Tougaloo College, where she takes college courses as part of the Jackson Public Schools Tougaloo Early College High School program. She has also been accepted to and has received scholarships from nearly two dozen colleges and universities mm -hmm. across the country. Mm -hmm. Her top picks are all historically black colleges and universities. Xavier, Jackson State, Alcorn, 
Tuvalu and Fisk are just a few of her favorites. Jalea loves to help people. While attending Northwest IB Middle School, she organized a hurricane relief drive. She has won numerous awards and was named Miss Congeniality in the 2018 and 2019 Mid-South Beauty and Bold pageant. Mm. Jalea will graduate high school with her associate's degree in biology from Tougaloo College. Her hundreds of hours of community service, along with her academic success, were keys to securing her scholarship offerings. Ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you Ms. Jalea Ritas. Also, Dr. Green, I'm sorry, I would like to acknowledge her parents, her granddad, yes. and her mom. So please, Mr. Reedus and Ms. Reedus, please stand so that we can also give you a round of applause. And her grandma is here as well. And also, Dr. Evans, thank you all for your hard work. Major Branch was also essential in, in ensuring that um, Jalea received those scholarships. Thank you, Mrs. Marshall Thomas. Thank you to the family for being here and, and allowing us the opportunity to serve and work alongside and learn from um, Jalea. I said to Jalea earlier, um, I'm telling a little bit of her business, she's already um, approaching a 30, uh, I believe she's a 28 on the ACT. Nice. Um, yes, um, obviously with all of the schools that are vying for her and all of the scholarship award money already in the bag, let alone those others, and we're claiming it, um, even more to, to come. Um, it's just a, a pretty amazing uh, position to be in, to have schools fighting over you, yes. right? Um, because they know what you bring and they know that you will add to them. It's not just about them helping you to achieve your dreams, but the fact that you will add That's right. in very real ways to their campus and to their stats and to their success. Um, as you go on and do more and more uh, great things. So I, I can't say enough about you. I'm so proud of you, proud to know you, excited to uh, see where you go next. And, um, you know, if, if it's okay, come by and holler at me before you make your public announcement so that I'll know before the rest of the people <laughs> where you're going. You know, just a little perk of the job. I would love to know first or maybe after the family. Again, kudos to you. Uh, excited for, for where you'll go next and excited for what you've achieved already. Board members, that actually concludes my remarks this evening. I um, want to thank the community and, and uh, all of Team JPS for the hard work that continues to happen to uh, make amazing outcomes happen for young people. Thank you, Dr. Green. And um, thank you for all the board member recognition. Um, mm. the, I don't know about y'all, but, but there was one gift in particular that really stood out. I'm not going to call out the school, but it's a school in my ward. And the, the students made a booklet of recognition. And you could tell a lot of work and thought went into it. So it's now standing up on behind my desk for all my Zoom calls. So folks from all over the country saw this. Um, and it's just. Um, you know, we, don't, we, we do this work for the students, and Ms. Hilliard reminds me of that all the time, uh, just to take a student-centered approach. And, but we don't really get to see them a lot outside of the ones that live with us, you know, or, you know, or family. Um, and so uh, I just wanted, and, and I know that it takes work to get those things. There's all kinds of other things. It's appreciated. So I just want to say thank you. And um, to the team, uh, the bond recognition uh, at Forest Hills, um, high school that was just a phenomenal day board members if you haven't been down to forest hill i would really just encourage you to 
make the trip. Um, I think it's the most beautiful high school in the district. Um, and it just feels complete, you know, the, from the Coliseum to the science labs to the library to the hallways. I mean, it's just, it was just a, a, a great day and just kudos to the team. I know we'll have more opportunity to celebrate that later. The communications, I got a note from a member of the community today saying we saw the, the bond recognition. Thank you. So anyways, I just, lots of good things. Want to share that um, before we move into the, the rest of the board meeting. So. Um, we are now at public participation. Attorney Turner, I think I see one comment. Is that correct? Yes. Board members, you have one person who signed up to address you today. Tony Cooley would like to address you regarding Viola Lake. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? L let me say, uh, first of all, before I get started, uh, it's hard to follow mm -hmm. Elijah Joy and Miss yeah. Rita's, uh, <laughs> you know, this uh, pales in comparison. Congratulations to all of them. Also want to say thank you to the, the thanks so much. I want to say thank you to the board uh, and to Dr. Green. I know uh, from the community, you all do a lot of work and you don't get praised very often. So I want to thank you for what you do for all of us. Um, good evening, members of the board. Thank you for affording me time to speak. My name is Tony Cooley, CEO of the Systems Companies. Bill Cooley and I are key supporters of the Center for Social Entrepreneurship, or CSE. I am here today with Ms. Shante Crockett, CSE's Executive Director. We understand the city may be holding additional discussions with the board regarding joining it in a suit to sever the Viola Lake Trust. In case there is another district vote required, we wanted to present to the board again, reiterate our commitment, discuss our progress, and share our analysis of the land. The proposed CSE project for the Viola Lake land is the LMC Youth Entrepreneurship and Tech Center, which would be named after Lillian M. Cooley, a former Blackburn librarian. While a formal capital campaign has not yet been held, CSE has raised a quarter of a million for this four to six point, uh, six million dollar project. If the district requires some assurance from the CSE board, CSE will provide it. In every, in every decision we make, we use the rule that the best predictor of future performance is past performance. When applied to Viola Lake, we considered the following. In the past 30 years, only one organization made a couple of offers to build a soccer complex on Viola Lake. The educational use language greatly limits who will be interested in buying it, likely only nonprofits and charter schools. The liability and reputational risk continues to grow as homeless occupy the building. A recent killing across the street, a, a recent killing resulted across the street from the property. Business people situate businesses where consumers and opportunity exist. West and South Jackson are not those communities where there has been a lot of new investment. There are a lot of sunk costs that will, almost, will be almost impossible to recoup. CSE is a good organization shown through past performance. You named CSE's after school program your 2019 elementary after school program, best elementary after school program. CSE has renovated 30 houses purchased from the city and state, putting them back on the tax rolls. Many are occupied by JSU students. It has renovated a community center it has exposed our West Jackson neighbors to the fourth industrial revolution by erecting a solar carport and purchasing an electric vehicle in which the CSE staff rides. We've gotten a Kellogg supported entrepreneurship training program. We've uh, hosted your ch third grade uh, girls to a summer coding camp and we've uh, conducted, we've erected an adult community house where community resources are shared with the community. Entering, the suit, entering into the suit with the city would enhance the image of the city on the move. I'd like to thank you uh, for entertaining, uh, entertaining our request. Uh, we are committed to West Jackson. We've been there since 1994, and we think that the best and highest use for this property would be a, a youth tech and entrepreneurship uh, center, and we commit to um, making that a reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Cooley. 
Um, again, we, uh, we really um, appreciate and encourage community members to um, use the public comment period, of course. Um, the board believes the public's comment is very important. Um, we listen and consider comments. We don't respond at the time. And again, we just encourage um, people to take up uh, different items with leadership, whether it's in the school or with the administration, um, should that be it. Uh, also, board members can be reached at our email addresses, which are on the JPS website. Um, next, we will move on to board member reports. Board members, I did have one um, topic that I wanted to raise for discussion at the board meeting, and it's, it's not really for action, but it's around the bond um, oversight committee. Um, and so, um, for consideration, uh, this is a thought, and again, this we, we can talk about it tonight or we can come back and revisit it. There's no action on it, but we currently have a oversight committee that was formed uh, when the bond was passed. Uh, it was really in response to concerns that were raised about the lack of transparency that existed on previous bonds in oversight. And so, um, we created a, and it was also at a time where we were in a leadership transition. We were, Dr. Green may have just come on, and um, so board members each appointed a member from each ward to serve on the oversight committee. So we are now approaching the end of the bond. However, we have an even greater source of funds coming in through the federal government. There will be additional infrastructure improvements, undoubtedly, that will be made. So one thought that I had, again, for consideration is, because um, there's, uh, there's been questions raised about do we continue to appoint people, do people continue to stay, what's the process? What are y'all's thoughts around having an advisory committee that's staffed by the district we could recommend people to serve on that committee, but rather than use it as a almost side-by-side -side governance function to the board, again, that it serves as an advisory committee um, and to focus on the dollars, to continue to, to exist in a public meeting format. Um, it, it allows us to tap networks, um, but also puts the staffing back on the district. Um, versus what we have now is where board members appoint, and I'll be honest, I, I, I remember the process for appointing, uh, you know, giving my recommendation. I, I have not engaged with the um, Ward 1 member, largely because we get updates here monthly, um, and I, so I receive the information timely. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to just throw out for consideration and, and um, invite feedback from board members as well. Can you explain it one more time, exactly what you mean by advisory committee? Sure. So, so right now there's a bond oversight committee, and it's staff, there's seven people who are on it. Um, each board member appoints a member to serve on it. And so by, by advisory committee, there are, there are a number of advisory committees in the districts. That, you know, there's a parent advisory committee. There's, I think there's a high school student, maybe it's a student advisory committee, and then there are others. And so. What I was proposing is that as the bond program wind down, the oversight committee for the bond wind down, but the function of having a group of citizens or residents of the city who are engaged with the district, um, that that form still exists, that it still exists within the public meeting format. Um, and, and again, obviously we could make recommendations to Dr. Green, the leadership about who might be good people based on our, our networks within the city that, to serve on that. I was just, I was just trying to think through, it, it also gives, you know, so there are some people who have served, been able to serve the entire time. They may or may not be interested in continuing to serve. This creates an opportunity for other people to serve as well, if people want to get all, you know, so there's, that's what is behind my raising this um, consideration. I think it makes sense. I, I, I think it's good to have um, more community involvement uh, and, and input. And I, you know, I think the reasoning for us to have the oversight committee to begin with, I think it still stands. And uh, I think with the with the work we know that's going to be ongoing even beyond this past um, bond issue. It would be something I would support. 
Absolutely. I, I definitely agree with it. And um, I just wondered because I think my question was um, with the bond oversight, I think it was constrained to particular wards. Would this advisory committee be have that same kind of constraint? And, and I would look to Dr. I mean, again, to, to to create guidelines around the advisory committee, I think one advantage of it is that it actually doesn't need to, I mean, we would want representation, that would be, I think, like a non-negotiable, that we'd want representation from across the entire city. And if we wanted to add other people based on specialty or experience or, um, we could actually probably create a more inclusive committee and a committee with more expertise. Dr. Siva, this is Kim Harrison. Yes, Dr. Harrison. Uh, I think I think that um, your suggestion that you rate is a reasonable one, um, and I seem to have echo, and I'm not sure why, but I'll be brief. I like that last thing that you said, where we would try to uh, combine. Mm -hmm. the two models that we've seen because to remind folks how we ended up with the ward representation is because we really we were also new to all of this work which we had just been assigned and we wanted to also be very connected to our communities and our wards. Mm -hmm. So if there is a way that we could not lose that piece and I think what you described at the end would, would include um, citizens who brought a variety of skills to the table and also uh, had uh, roots or concerns in a variety of our communities, which would include all of our wards. Mm -hmm. So I uh, just wanted to say that. I hope that, that made a little bit of sense. I think there is um, a real advantage to having representatives from each of the wards because it will, um, you know, keep people involved. Um, and I, w I would like to say th uh, this is probably something that we need to give a bit more thought to and not make a recommendation tonight if that's mm -hmm. the direction that we go in. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, would, I would like to see us give a bit more thought to it and maybe have a bit more discussion at another time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would agree with that, um, let me tell you. Okay. Any other thoughts, comments? Uh, Ms. President, I would, uh, I would support it, but I do agree with Ms. Hilliard. Uh, the superintendent or the administration is going to be in charge, and I did love the idea of uh, people with particular skills and expertise, because I think that that's what's going to move us forward. Mm -hmm. So if we could have, you know, at some time a discussion, a deeper dive into it, because I'd like to know, you know, what the mm -hmm. administration's thinking is mm -hmm. around this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I think that's great. And, and looks, uh, Dr. Nassie, you wave my hand. Do you want to respond? Go ahead, please. Yeah, yeah, I just I appreciate the comments and the um, uh, sentiments shared here. Um, I, I I definitely uh, see the value in and look forward to continuing to operate with an advisory group to support us and, and helping us to filter through and consider some options and, and some of the work ahead. Uh, if it's okay, Dr. Sivak, I'll ask our team to, um, or have our team to draft some kind of a, uh, um, a scope for what that committee could be, how it could be comprised, and, and expectations for their work. 
Um, I do want to say, <laughs> though, that um, you know, there, it's not always been easy to identify an individual by ward for each ward. And so what we bring to you, just to kind of manage expectations about where w the t angle that we'll take when we come to you, what we bring to you will likely not have a non-negotiable for a ward representation. Because what we don't want to do is spend, you know, uh, have to uh, be struggling to identify individuals to serve. And if someone is not serving or can't or needs to resign and then finding someone else. And that's, there's a level of management around that, that, that I, mm -hmm. this needs to be additive and, and not something that, that creates more um, of a challenge for the team. And so we'll bring you know, some ideas on that. And um, the good thing is you all have expressed a lot of what, what I would want to see in the committee anyway. So there you go. The, the only other thing that I would add to it is just kind of the reminder that we had at the time that this is, uh, uh, we call it an oversight committee, but it's really an, an advisory committee, right? And that ultimately anyone who serves on it would understand that those people current and future who serve on this board have the responsibility for, for really making the final decisions on anything. So that, that committee would remain an advisory committee and not have any kind of executive authority to do anything. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I, I definitely agree with um, Dr. Green on the whole war thing, only because there are several volunteers um, that are, are that could be very committed to certain schools in certain zones, but they might not necessarily live in that ward. But they might be very committed by being alumni, being grandparents, being uh, aunties and uncles of children in that particular zone or ward, and they not they might not necessarily live in that ward, but they are committed. To the to the to the residents of that ward. All great points. Well, Thompson, I I really affirm that because that's what's going to make the difference. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, board members. This I really appreciate the insight and the discussion. And and my understanding is we'll put the charge to Dr. Green to bring a proposal back to us along the just the normal way that we do business and then we can talk about that'll allow us to have more discussion we'll do it outside of action so that, that again we can have a more robust discussion and, and uh, plot a path forward okay thank you um next we'll move on to uh school well let me just ask are there any committee updates i know the policy committee has been very active and dr harrison i did not tee you up beforehand but just want to make sure that i'm not moving too fast if there were any updates from the policy committee uh, no sir i'm good and i um affirm dr green's remarks as well about we can't let all of this slow us down and put another layer of burden on our, on our team and leadership. Great. Thank you. Okay, well, we will move on with our agenda. Um, our next item is the student school, school board representative. Uh, our scholar tonight is from Lanier High School, and Ms. Marshall Thomas will introduce Jim Hill. Jim Hill. Oh, it says, it's, I'm reading a script. It says Lanier. <laughs> All right, my bad. Jim Hill. Oh, that's okay. Good okay. evening again, Dr. Seebeck board members, Dr. Green. At this time, I would like to introduce our <clears throat> student school board representative, Kayla Hazlitt, is a senior at Jim Hill High School. Um, Kayla's career goals um, is to become an economist. Um, she has strengths in mathematics and digital literacy and um, to become a famed author. Um, she's written several poems and also enjoys writing both fictional and non-fictional stories. She plans to attend Millsaps or Mississippi State University and double major in economics and creative writing. Good 
afternoon. Good afternoon. To the superintendent. To the superintendent, Dr. Eric Green, assistant superintendents, board member, oh, excuse me, members, teachers, staff, parents, and students. My name is Kayla Hassler. I am the 2021-2022 school board representative for Jim Hill High School. My topic for today is the longest school day that has been implemented in 2019 in the school day policy. Today, I would like to start off by showing the school day policy by its code AF and its main two points about the instructional time that is supposed to be used for all high schools. Okay, then I'm not gonna read all of that. <laughs> so, the number of hours, blah, 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 five and a half hours. Teaching day, a day is which a minimum of 330 minutes of instruction time. Evaluation, another district approved group testing is provided. We exceed this time by a good amount. But before I go any further, I would like to show the historical call and scholars perspective of the longest school day. Scholars were not clear about the reason behind the time change in high schools. A survey rendered to scholars and parents would have been beneficial to, to sorry, my eye. Yes. Okay. Yes. Solicite their opinion on the time change in the high schools. I personally believe if more buses were available, scholars could be transported to school on time while extending time until 4 o'clock p.m. for high school. Mm. What I mean by this, or what I've learned, is that one of the reasons why we have later time, a later time for getting out of high school is now because the buses were not transporting the students on time. Research shows that there are disadvantages to a longer school day. Here, and here are some of the disadvantages. I'm just going to read a few. Does not give students enough time, study time and homework time at home. Pushes kids at, with a lot of homework to stay up later or at night, <laughs> resulting in their lack of attentiveness in this morning. So, I'm um, skip that one. Single parent teachers arrive home later to their children, and mm, I'm not gonna read the rest. <laughs> and now, now currently we get we are getting out at 4 p.m. and we would like to go back to the past time of 3:30 p.m. Currently, high school is getting 306 minutes of instruction time. Mm. Oh, I skipped. <laughs> Uh, but I'm, I'm just going to go back a little bit and say I did a little bit of research about, like, let me read this first. Jackson Public Schools high school students are in school between five and a half or eight hours per day. But in research, and basing off the other countries, con the other countries, they are doing way, way better than us, and they only need either six and a half hours and five hours in school time. And so I'm gonna go back to this point. Currently, high school is getting 360 minutes of instruction time, and that is six hours of instruction time, but we only need five and a half hours. So, so in conclusion, if we try to increase the number of drivers and buses, I think we can get all student transport ported to school on time and turn back to a short school day. And late and this is the past times we was in 2018. This is the new time and this is the the future time people want to go back to. And on the slide it says the buses are not transporting students on time presently. So the question is, do we keep extending the school day or fix the bus issue? <laughs> and 
And here's it's another reason why I've heard why we went all the way up to a 4 p.m. get out time. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go too much into this, but <laughs> it was said that, um, well, I'm just going to talk about this one instead <laughs> because it don't match up with the slide. Uh, so, we can we can hire more bus drivers, increase the salaries of bus drivers, sign bonuses to attract new drivers, offer incentives to teachers and staff to become certified drivers, or buy more new buses. And if you ask how will we do that, well, some people have told me that we can use like the COVID-19 relief funds or the school bond <laughs> reference. Random, yeah. And that's the last slide. All right, thank you, Ms. Hazlitt. Um, board members, uh, are there any questions or comments? So, Ms. Hazlitt. First of all, I really wanted to say um, thank you for pulling this all together. I did not know that there were different hours in the different countries that you share. So those are good use of data. My question for you is, do we need to fix the school day or do we need to fix our transportation system? Um, so first, what I like everybody been saying or what I have noticed and what over the three years of us going to the 4 p.m., they, it's like, after doing all my research, we we can go back to the time. So it's both, we either, we both go back to 3.30 time and also because of the issue with the buses, we can fix that also. Okay. Thank you. Is that the general feeling of your thinking of your classmates? Um, mm, I'm not just thinking about my classmates. It's also the teachers that have been saying it also, and what I just heard around the past these three years. I guess I should have said schoolmates, not necessarily all oh, <laughs> seniors. Um. um, like it was like all my past years, like back when I was in ninth grade. This when it first started. Mm -hmm. Um, back when we when I went through tenth and eleventh grade, like by the time I got to eleventh grade, people was complaining about it. Okay, any more questions? Thank you for your presentation. I just wanted to thank her for her presentation. And it's very provocative. And uh, you raised two very pertinent issues. Time for learning in, in the school setting and a transportation and bus system that's more efficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Dr. Green? Uh, Ms. Hazlitt, thank you for uh, your presentation tonight. Um, one of the things that uh, I would encourage you to do is, um, because you referenced I've been hearing, or one of the things that I heard as a reason for the change, or um, I think, and, and that sort of thing, I would encourage you to have a conversation with your school leadership and perhaps even with the um, uh, with your assistant superintendent from high schools, for high schools, to um, to get the truth about actual decisions. Because the reality is this this bus issue was a part of it, and so I, I would well I wasn't here when the decision was made, but um, uh, that's the story that I've been told as well. But to go to the sources of the folks who are involved in the decision making to get the the to get 
that source material, that source information, so that then when you talk about it, you can speak from, this is not just what I'm hearing from my friends or from some teachers or from community members who may or may not actually know, but to go to the source to, to get, that, um, get that verified. And then the arguments that you make can be rooted and grounded in you know, actual rationale from the decision makers. Um, just some encouragement around that. Uh, this will be an interesting one. I think we, as a, as a system, have grappled with, uh, not I think, I know, we have grappled with the whole uh, bell schedules um, and just the bell schedules in and of themselves. Time for teachers to plan, time for scholars to learn, time for scholars to have all of the other experiences that we want them to have within the school day as well as this issue with transportation. And, and you've rightfully lifted them up together because so often we talk about them as though they have to be inextricably linked. And the reality is they don't have to be linked. We actually could, kind of to Mr. Or Dr. Sivak's question, we could fix the bus system. But if there are real concerns about the school day and all the challenges with it, then maybe both things need to be addressed. Um, but I think that's going to be our continued work together to, to determine what needs to happen with transportation, because transportation needs to be fixed, and what needs to, be, what needs to happen with bell schedules, if, if at all, um, or what happens during the day to ensure that that's of quality. So I appreciate you lifting both of those up. I don't agree that they have to be married together, but they have been for our district, and so that's been the lived experience, I think, for a lot of our scholars, team members, and others. So thank you for this uh, sparking this conversation tonight. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, next board members, we will move on to our review of school improvement benchmark results. Uh, and Dr. Cormack, I believe, will be presenting this information. Good evening to President Dr. Sivak, Dr. Green, members of the board, and our JPS team and family. The Jackson Public School District Office of School Support presents for information purposes only school year 21-22 school improvement update for schools that are identified as Comprehensive Support and Improvement, or CSI. I'm standing in this evening for our school support team to share the school-specific data. As you'll recall, we have provided previous uh, robust updates on our district's benchmark 1 and 2 performance as well as updates on school climate and attendance in virtual and in-person instructional formats. So captured in the reports in your materials, you'll find the following. One, overall school proficiency goals. Two, benchmark one and benchmark two assessment proficiency results against which you can measure individual schools progress and gaps toward goals. Three, student enrollment and attendance data and four, disciplinary infractions data. This information is meant to provide you with a snapshot of school performance trends against which we are deploying targeted instructional and school climate support. Thank you, Dr. Cormack. Board members, are there any questions? Hearing none. Uh, Dr. Cormack, I just have one. I know I sent a couple in advance. Um, what, based on the, um, the, the materials we received, what would you list as maybe the um, top bright spot in the data and, and the spot that causes the most concern? So um, generally, um, I would say in terms of, a, a, well, let me end with the, the, begin with the thorn and then end <laughs> on a positive note. I appreciate that. Um, as we look at um, some of the struggles with attendance, particularly among our secondary scholars, that is one where we're put, um, addressing particular energy around um, how we re-engage some of our scholars that have been disengaged, those scholars that have been chronically absent. Um, our 
uh, dropout prevention coordinator and the attendance and truancy officers are engaged in some strategies to re-engage scholars to do home visits um, in partnership with school principals who are also developing strategies around how do we make certain that school is a joyful learning environment so that students are invested in continuing um, in that positive trajectory. But even at, at our elementary schools as well, where we've noted uh, less than 95% uh, daily attendance, uh, there are uh, school-wide incentive systems through our PBIS structures to incentivize coming to school and to celebrate that um, on a weekly basis so that students um, really um, do miss out on those positive incentives if they're not there and present. And so we can create a culture of uh, incentivizing those positive behaviors. I would say um, in terms of some positive trends, um, one of the things that we saw across the board were some um, measured growth in proficiency from benchmark one to two that we really um, do want to celebrate and highlight. Um, we also know that we experienced the pandemic last year, and so we see um, some schools within this cohort that also have really exemplary growth, um, both in our uh, promising 25 scholars and uh, with the school subgroups overall. So um, those are some promising trends that we'd like to highlight. Great, thank you. <laughs> All right, board members, next we will move to our review of various policies for amendment, creation, deletion. I believe Attorney Moore will present this information. Um, and again, I just want to shout out the policy committee and Attorney Moore and her, her team. It, it's really great to just see a crop of policies come each meeting. This is a standard for the board to, to, to move through the policies, and uh, it doesn't happen by accident. So Attorney Moore, with that, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Green, Board President, Dr. Seawag, and board members. The Office of the General Counsel recommends that the Jackson Public School District's Board of Trustees review the recommendations related to the amendment, consolidation, and deletion of the following policies, CHAA, Wellness Policies and Procedures, IB, Instructional Goals, ICA, Curriculum Development, Resources and Equipment, IDA, Instructional Management System, IDAA, Gifted Education Program, IDB, Accreditation, IDG, Co-Curricular Activities, IEC, Scheduling for Instruction, IEF, Departmental Organization, IFA, Programs of Studies, IFF, Teachers Aid slash Assistance, IGBA, Early Release, IHAC, Special Programs, IKG, Use of Communication Devices by Teachers, IMB, Vocational and Career Technical Education, and IN, the policy of the same name, Vocational and Career Technical Education. And all of these recommended changes were made to bring our policies up to date and for brevity. Great. Board members, any questions, comments? No questions. I just want to second what you said there, Dr. Sivak, at the beginning. As a member of the policy committee, and I know Dr. Harrison would echo this, the work that the staff is doing um, in these meetings is really impressive. And it's, uh, it really is a pleasure to work with them as we really improve how this district operates and the, the policies that undergird all that we do. So a big shout out to them. It, and would encourage people to, you know, it is accessible to the public, those meetings. They can tune in and they can, they can watch and they can see the, the business that's going on. But it's, it's really good work. So thank you, Attorney Moore. Thank you. And thank you to the policy committee as well. Great. With that, we will move on to the information action item section of our agenda. And our first item is the approval of photography vendors uh, for 2021-2022. And um, Mr. Johnson will present this information. Thank you. To Superintendent Dr. Green, Board President Dr. Sivak, and members of the board, legal counsel, and district leaders. Uh, the administration is seeking board approval of the recommended list of vendors to provide photography services to various school locations on an as-needed basis. There are no district funds being used as the scholars and their families purchase the various photo packages directly from the vendors. School principals, along with their site council members, may select a photography vendor to use for all events for the entire school year based on our list of recommended vendors. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Board members, are there any questions? 
Okay, hearing none, let's, I'll take a motion to approve. I shall move. Second. Ms. Silliard has moved. Ms. Luckett has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nays, the motion carries. Next, uh, Attorney Turner will present the approval, a request for approval of the Labaster confidential, Mutual Confidentiality and Non-Disclosure Agreement. So, board members, as you are aware, I review all the contracts that come before you for approval. And um, I was presented a contract, a software services agreement with a company called Labster. Um, district administration, uh, particularly the early college high school, wants to license uh, an academic software program for the early, it's a 3D science simulation project. And if you want to know more than that, you probably have to ask the district administration. <laughs> but in any event, um, I was presented the software services agreement to review um, and to negotiate for your approval. In the course of reviewing that software services agreement, it incorporated the terms and conditions of some other agreements that Labster has with some third parties. So since those contract terms would be incorporated in the contract with JPS, I asked to see them because obviously we wouldn't want to agree to a contract that had terms and conditions that we had not seen. Um, and so when I requested those from Labster, they told me that those were confidential agreements that Labster had with other third-party vendors and that in order to provide them to me, we would have to sign a confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement. So I negotiated that confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement, which is what you have before you for approval. And if you approve it, then we will execute that with Labster. They will then provide me those third-party agreements that I can review, and then we can see if we can finally negotiate an agreement with Labster so that the district can license the software that the administration wants for the early college high school. I will say that other than these third-party agreements, we have, we have a, an agreement that I'm prepared to recommend to you. So as long as there's nothing objectionable in these agreements, then I think we'd be prepared to move forward with presenting to you the software services agreement so the administration can get that software. So that's what you have before you, the confidentiality and non-disclosure agreement so I can get those third-party agreements. Thank you, Attorney Turner. Board members, any questions? Hearing none, I'll take a motion. I shall move. Second. Okay. Mrs. Hilliard has moved. Ms. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? The motion carries. Next, we have the request to approve the issuance of contracts for certified non-administrative staff members along with the salary scale for school year 2022-2023. Ms. Sandra Lyons, Executive Director of Human Resources. Great evening, Dr. Green, Board President Dr. Sivak, members of the board. On behalf of, the, of, on behalf of the administration, I'm requesting approval of the teacher salary scale for the 2022-23 school year and the issuance of contracts for certified non-administrative staff members, which includes teachers, counselors, librarians, psychometrists for the 2022-23 school year. Thank you, Ms. Lyons. Board members, any questions? One question I had, it was exciting to see these this early. I know it's February. Um, how are we look in this, in, in this may be, if we need to come back in another meeting with this, it, do, how are we doing on like vacancies for next year, given that we're getting out this early? Do we have a sense of, of where we are? We do have a sense of where we are. And actually I have uh, Dr. Tommy Niles here, our recruiter. And we do have numbers that we can share with you. I don't know if you want us to share them with you tonight. But, um, Dr. Green, what you want to do? Okay, Tim, you want to come up? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Dr. Knowles. Uh, so, the actual numbers as far as vacancies and everything cannot be determined until after the contract signing period. Uh, we do have projections. Those projections tend to be rather large and could potentially be alarming just based off of how we calculate them. But we tend to not actually like to report those numbers until we know for sure who's returning, how many teachers have decided to return to the district. That way we can have an actual count of where our vacancies are and start uh, and continue uh, 
implementing our strategy for recruitment for our teachers. Dr. Nalls, if you, ha if you have it or can recall the numbers, can you kind of share last year where we were and or um, where we were, I think it's April last year and where we want to be April this year? Correct. So yeah. I wasn't, I didn't have the presentation or the, the numbers with me, uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Neer. Uh, so uh, last report we checked, typically when uh, in April, when we began reporting through our Opening with Excellence meetings, we were at about 200 vacancies. Mm -hmm. So our target is to be at or below that number as we move into April 30th of this year. Uh, when we started out, normally around this time, as we're projecting and calculating, that number tends to be around 500 or so. Mm -hmm. But that's not the actual number until we know. We base that number off of expiring licenses. Uh, if we have provisional licenses, how many of those positions or teachers whose licenses are expiring that we have to renew. Uh, any uh, unfilled positions that we're carrying this year, along with district retirees and things of that number. So once we get through the hiring period, then, uh, or the, excuse me, the contract period, then that gives us a more accurate number. So. Um, typically in March, so just going back from 2018, um, in March of 2018, we had about 246 true vacancies. March of 2019, that number was reduced to 148. March of 2020, we were down to 113. And March of 2021, for the school year, we were at 75. Currently this year, in January of 2022, we're carrying about 50 unfilled vacancies or true vacancies within the district, not unfilled, I said that wrong. So 50 true vacancies, 35 of which are unfilled. Um, in August of last year, we began the year with about 99 true vacancies, 46 of which were unfilled. And so currently comparing where we were at the beginning of the year to where we are now, uh, we're at about 97.9% .9 staffed mm -hmm. currently for this year. So looking at uh, for next year, in May of 2019, we started with about 460 vacancies. May of 2020, we had 523. In May of 2021, we reduced that number to 205. And so we're projecting about, uh, last reported, about 501, uh, but we expect that number to decrease greatly after we get past the contract signing period. Okay. No, thanks for that, and, and I think the one of the points that resonates is the trend. There's this a downward trend, and I know that's a, there's been a ton of work done by you and your office. And um, again, it was just seeing the contracts under that prompt. We just wanted to check in on that. And what I'm hearing too is there's going to be much um, more refined data available once we get past approving the contracts a little bit further along. So, and, and being able to issue contracts this early is actually a part of our strategy. So that gives us more time to be able to identify the numbers and then be able to get out in the field to recruit teachers if needed uh, and help work with our own teachers as a retention effort to make sure that they have what they need in order to be retained before the school year ends. Great point. All right, board members, any more questions? If not, I'll take a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I move that we accept. Second. Mr. Figures moved. Dr. Luckett, a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays, the motion carries. Next, uh, Dr. Smith will present the request to approve an amendment to the Insight Education Group Master Consulting Agreement. Great evening. Good evening. evening. So President um, Seaback, Board President, to um, our other officers, members of the board, and to Superintendent Green, um, it brings um, me great privilege again to come before you about Project Ignite. The administration is requesting for approval the continual contractual agreement um, for the scope of work for Project Ignite, and I've asked Dr. Um, Niles to join me again um, at the po uh, podium because part of this Ignite grant also helps with HR and recruitment. So we want to continue um, to be able to implement the uh, work that has begun at those nine schools that were identified within the grant. 
which is Barack Obama Magnet Elementary School, Base Elementary School, Blackburn Middle School, Brinkley Middle School, Cardoza Middle School, Galloway Elementary, Pecan Park Elementary, and Provine High School, and Van Winkle Elementary. And so um, the work that has, been, that has been done thus far has enabled um, those schools to strengthen their instructional leadership teams, provide more focused PLCs, and feedback to teachers using the advanced feedback platform, and that would also help to uh, provide strategic leadership coaching as we continue implementation and strategies. And so I did provide for you in your board materials the um, implementation report as of uh, today. And so just to highlight just a couple of things with the implementation of the grant, we want to continue to uh, have organization efficiency of performance management. And there were some things that we noted that were there was no evidence of as with implementation to this point, but it will allow us the opportunity to increase the knowledge of research-based strategies for effective instruction, also the opportunity to um, increase educated effectiveness and student achievement. And so Dr. Sivak, you had questions about recruitment, and so just very briefly, um, Dr. Niles is going to talk about some recruitment efforts for teachers that's also uh, through the Project Ignite. Good evening again. So uh, through Project Ignite, um, many, many, a lot of the work that we've done through recruitment um, has come in the form of the recruitment videos that we developed in, in conjunction with the Inside Education Group through Project Ignite, uh, and also uh, the redesign of the employment tab on the JPS website. So a lot of that work was done in conjunction with them, uploading those videos there, making sure that the employment site was uh, more informative, uh, uh, user accessible uh, to help guide people to apply for positions and things like that on the platform. <laughs> As we move through the contract period, and uh, once we finish that, we're able to identify specific vacancies for our nine program schools within the grant. It'll be the role of my team with uh, Project Ignite to be able to help address those vacancy issues with uh, those specific schools to make sure that they're fully staffed uh, in conjunction with the program. <laughs> as well as working in, conjun in conjunction with Insight in order to help deal with any certification issues, licensure issues, um, CEUs, and things like that to make sure that the staff in those schools are stable and we're able to retain them year for year throughout the grant. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Are there any questions? Board members, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Board members, is there a motion to approve the master consulting agreement, the amendment to the uh, agreement? I shall move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Ms. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? Aye. The motion carries. Uh, next, uh, Ms. Purnell will present the monthly financial report. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. To Board President Dr. Sivak, to the Board members, Dr. Green, colleagues, and JPS family. Uh, today, the administration is recommending that the board approves the monthly financial report for the period ending January 31st, 2022. The monthly financial report consists of the statement of fund balance, the budget status report, the bank reconciliation report, and the district maintenance cash flow report. A few highlights from um, the um, financial statements include the um, statement of fund balance. Uh, if you recall from last last month, um, the, our fund balance was roughly about $5 million, $5.5 million at, at December and uh, this year and last year it was at 9.9, .9, I believe, percent, I mean, 9.9 uh, .9 million dollars. As you can notice at this point in time and juncture, we are getting an alignment a whole lot better this year at this point in time. In January 31st of 2022, we were roughly at $9.4 million for fund balance as compared to 11.4 of last year of 21. This is approximately about a 17% uh, decrease from last year. One thing I want to make note of, uh, we did have our charter payment 
that was due this year to the charter schools, and that payment was roughly about $8.1 million, which is about a million dollars more than what it was the year last year. Last year was roughly about $7.1 million of payments that we had to make in January of uh, the same time last year. So that's one note that I want to um, bring in, uh, in, uh, to the reality for us to review. Also, if you notice, child attrition has continued to have the uh, significant fund balance in support of our school cafeterias. ESSA 2 has a negative balance, of course, due to timing of what ESSA 2 can, uh, in relation to the drawdowns for, uh, from MDE, exception to ed is in the same category. They also have a negative balance due to uh, timing. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, this year, this month, it will be the first month we will be drawing funds on FY22 for exceptional ed. Their uh, grant just uh, actually got approved. So that's the timing on the drawdowns. On the budget status report, if you look at page 3 of 13, it shows that we have 43.11% of the revenue has been collected as of January of 2022 compared to 43.23% of um, revenue at the same time of last year. Expenditures are running about 48.62% for this year as compared to 47.65% this time last year. Um, all of our bank reconciliations are, have been re reconciled in a timely manner as of December 31st of 2021. The cash flow on that one, we are showing a, um, a balance of 3.1 as compared to 2.6 of last year. And part of that is contributed to the fact that we uh, are we getting funds back, repaying from um, grants when they are we borrowing, loaning them money during the um, during the month, and then at the end of the month when we're getting recouping some of our funds back, we're trying to of course get the end of fund loans back into that category. So that's some of that issue as well. And you will notice that um, we had 2.6 as I said of January 2021. Our expenditures was 12.6 on uh, this year compared to 13.6 on January 2021. And the revenues collections, as I just stated, that's, that's basically um, because we were getting our funds back uh, from the different, um, you know, programs, from the different federal programs of getting our money back that they owe us at this point. And that's the reason behind that. Any questions on the financials? Before you go to questions, just want to uh, say another word. I can say another word on the charter school payment. Yeah. The comment that was made there, um, there's an increase of about a million dollars um, in charter payment this year. I want to break that down a little bit. There's, in, there's an increase um, this year of, I believe it was about 60 students, somewhere on the order of 60 additional students that we're um, supporting in charter schools this year compared to last year. Um, and if you tallied that up, that would only be about um, 200 or so thousand um, in difference in, in the pay from last year to this year. The um, additional pay is on the heels of the increased uh, per pupil uh, funding. And so last year, I believe it was uh, $3,276.39 per scholar. This year, it's $3,650.20 per scholar, so almost $400 increase. And so the, the million dollars, it's actually a, a good 800 or so thousand of that is due to the increase in per pupil um, funding. So we got the increase and we're paying out the increase to the, to the charter schools. Okay, so I, I, I want to just kind of clarify that uh, that additional million dollar in payment to charters, 800 or so of that is essentially a pass through. We got more, we pay more out. The 200 or so is really due to the uh, the difference in enrollment in charters from last year to this. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right, just wanted to make that point in case anyone got sticker shock like I did at first. <laughs> I'm glad you did. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you, Ms. Purnell. Board members, any questions about the financial report? All right, thank you, Ms.
Ms. Purnell. I, I appreciate the framing of the alignment. It was it was good to see the, the movement, particularly on the cash flow report. Um, so board members, is there a, a recommendation to approve the um, monthly financial report? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Ms. Hilliard has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And nays, the motion carries. Next, we will move on to the request to approve the resolution authorizing the issuance of, of one or more general obligation refunding bonds in an amount not to exceed $80 million. Ms. Purnell. Okay. Good evening again. Good evening. The program already been established. The, uh, as the board members, you may recall, last uh, in December, we did bring forth to you a, um, a resolution in order to um, seek out uh, possible funding uh, from the lower interest rates for possibly refunding of our bonds. A portion of it is 20, 2012A, 2015A, and bonds for 2018. Now what the resolution is, administration is recommending approval of a resolution authorizing and directing the preparation, execution, and delivery of the issuance of one of more general operation refunding bonds and the principal amount not to exceed $80 million for the purpose of refunding, restructuring certain debt of the district. The administration is also attaching all the form, uh, form documents related to the potential opportunity to refinance <coughs> a portion of those funds that we just uh, forementioned as outlined through our uh, financial advisor, Mr. Um, Thompson, who is in the audience today to answer any questions if we may have so at the, as going forward. But right now the action is being recommended from the, from the administration along with the district financial advisor to further improve the financial standing of the district. This recommendation is being requested to move forward in the bond issuance process of securing the best and lowest interest rates for, our current, for the current bonds. The bond market is increasing. So the district's financial advisor would like to move forward as quickly as possible on these. At, at the uh, current interest rate, the district has the potential opportunity to save approximately maybe $700,000 um, with, um, with this if we move forward at this point in time. I have noted that, um, from Mr. Thompson that the interest rate has increased by 0.25% uh, from December as compared to um, where we are as of, I think that was February the first at that point had moved to that to that um, to that standpoint of uh, increase. Hopefully it won't increase anymore. But he said he, it's, it's just the volatile of the market, possible that it may. But uh, also just be mindful if the uh, if we find that it will not benefit the district at all, we will he still will not move forward and will not come you know finish anything or try to get to the closing of that if it's not going to benefit us financially of any potential major savings. And that's something he will bring back um, to Superintendent Dr. Green and myself, and then we'll see if moving forward if we'll have to do anything further than that. Thank you, Ms. Purnell. Board members, are there any questions? I've got, I've got a number of questions um, that I'd just like to run through. So is the... Is the plan, assuming that the, well first let me ask about the $700,000. Is that $700,000 annually over the life of the bonds? That's over the life of the bond. Annually it may be roughly about $45,000 possibly, yeah. but it's going to be over the life of the bonds. Okay. And so right now, in board members, I'm looking at page A19 in the JPS 2022 geo refunding document. There's a debt service schedule there. So would the plan be to basically consolidate 2012A with 2015A with 2018? Is that the plan? So those are three bonds right now. They would all go into one? The plan is there will be a portion of those bonds of the 2012A, the 2015A, and the 2018 to become a, 22, a 2022 refunding bond of one. Uh, reason being on that is 
in uh, among all of those, we have interest rates of about 5% and 5.25% in some of those bonds. So what we're trying to do is trying to eliminate those with a less with a, um, a decrease of an interest rate so we can use those. Some of the interest rates in some of those bonds are already kind of beneficial, but we're trying to get the highest rates that there are so we can eliminate those and hopefully at a lower rate that we can use. So it will be just a portion of those bonds that we will be refunding, paying those, those uh, portions off, and we will still have that um, summer portion of the 2012A, but we are going to be moving toward a 2022 refunding uh, bond on that. And so the, if I'm looking out at the total debt service, do we still have a scenario where there's a big fall off in 2028 to 2029? There's a little bit of one, because right now, Part of what I'm trying to, what I'm asking is, so, so we get $43,000 a year. That's, I mean, it's something. It's a teacher, not even. Um, and so, but, you know, when we start paying debt off in 2024. So, for example, in 2024, you know, there's a million dollars that goes away. Now, if you look out at 2020, there's a balloon on it balloons, right? It goes from 394 to 2.2 million, which I've, I've, I've always, anyways, I'm not going to get into that here. But, you know, so let's go a little bit further out. In, in 2027, you know, there's $2 million in debt service that goes away. In 2028, there's 12 million. That seems like those are substantial opportunities. Do those go away? Like what is what is the what is the 2022 to 2038 debt schedule look like after we do this? Which page are you looking? You're out I'm at looking 19? at a page a19 of the JPS 2022 geo refunding POS document, and the reason I looked at that is just that's the that's the debt service schedule okay. currently. I'm with you. Now, ask your question again. Uh, I was just wondering what the, the debt, total debt service looks like after we do this, because it seems like there's some advantages to paying debt off, you know, in the context of $43,000 of savings a year. And just because, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, Namdi Thompson. Hey, Mr. With, Thompson. Uh, yeah. Government consultant serving as municipal advisor on this transaction. Um, I'm looking at the, the page that you're talking about there. Exactly. So as Ms. Burnell noted earlier, we're only going to be refinancing portions of each one of those different columns, the 2012As, the 20, 2015As, and the 2018As. If you look at that last column, mm -hmm. that shows 19 million, 19 million, 17 million going down. Think of that, that's where the $45,000 annually is coming from. The overall projection of the debt service is going to stay relatively the same. It's just going to drop about 45,000. Okay. So, so we're not doing anything to the structure of the debt, just lowering the interest rate thereby showing, excuse me, showing lower debt service payments on an annual basis. Okay. So effectively, and again, I know this is back of the envelope, mm -hmm. but if we were to look at that last column, on average, you would subtract $45,000 exactly. from each line. Absolutely. So we would still end up with a situation in 2027, 2028, where we see significant reduction in our debt service? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And there's and this was answered already. There's no extension on the terms. Everything's okay. No extension. No extension. Okay. Thank you. That that's actually really helpful. Um, I knew you were looking out for us, but I, I just you know needed <laughs> no. to get those questions. A absolutely. Answered. And and that page inside the preliminary official statement is used to go out to the market mm -hmm. so that they understand what the total picture looks like for Jackson Public School District. They want to see from a from a bird's eye perspective exactly what that debt service is going to look like. So you're exactly correct. Great. Okay. Thank you, board Thank members. You. Are there other questions? Okay. Hearing none. Is there a motion to approve the 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 basically given the district uh, authorization to go out and see if they can reduce the rate on the bonds? I shall move. Second. 
Ms. Hilliard has moved. Ms. Dr. Luckett has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Purnell, and thank you, Mr. Thompson, as well. Appreciate you being here tonight. Um, next, uh, board members, this was a late addition uh, to the agenda. This is the approval for the removal of the fine arts uh, insurance. Um, attorney Moore is going to present this information. And um, anyways, I'll, I'll let Attorney Moore present the information. Good evening again. Good evening. The Office of the General Counsel's Risk Management recommends that the board approve the renewal of our fine arts insurance coverage with the Porter's Insurance Agency. Um, this, is a, this is an annual renewal for our fine arts liability insurance. And this insurance protects um, the district against, um, it protects our fine arts and assets and investments against any perils that may damage or cause a financial loss. This policy protects, we have a, a number of paintings in the district um, that are uh, painted by a famous Mississippi author and they're valuable. So this policy protects that, those paintings up to $75,000 and the policy costs approximately $2,000 a year. Thank you, Attorney Moore. And board members, I, I, Ms. Williams and I talked about this beforehand. I believe she's also talked to Ms. Hilliard and, and given the amount of the premium, um, and also just the, what it was for, I felt like it was okay to bring to the board in a short time frame. Um, so if there are no objections, I'll take a motion. I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Attorney Moore. The thank motion you. carries. Um, Next, we move on to our consent agenda item for finance. Uh, board members, we've all had the opportunity to look at these in advance. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item for finance? Mm -hmm. So moved. Second. Dr. Luckin has moved. Ms. Hill has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays, the motion carries. Next, we'll move on to our consent agenda items general. Um, board members, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Dr. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Ms. Hilliard is seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? The motion carries. Next, we have our consent agenda item for personnel. Um, all of the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had the opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda item for personnel? I so move. Second. Ms. Hilliard has moved. Dr. Luckett is second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? The motion carries. Uh, next, board members, uh, we have a consideration to hold an executive session. Uh, is there a motion to go into executive session? To consider an executive session. Thank you. I move that we close the meeting to consider going into executive session. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any days? The motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Kaylin Phillips. Alexis Reed. Jalea Reedus. <laughs>